Hello everyone, my name is Andras Pop, and I'm going to present our paper titled Sequential Defaulting in Financial Networks, which is a joint work with Roger Wattenhofer. So the talk is going to focus on modeling and understanding financial networks, which is a very important and timely topic. If you want to analyze the situation of a bank or some other financial institution today, then you cannot just look at this single bank separately, because nowadays the financial system is in fact a network of many banks that are interconnected by various kinds of debt contracts. And if one of the banks goes bankrupt and cannot pay its liabilities, then this means that other banks do not receive their money, so they also go bankrupt, and so on. It can cause a cascading effect through the whole network. And because of this, the network-based study of these financial systems has been rapidly gaining attention in the last few years. The base model to study these systems, originally developed by Eisenberg and Neue, is actually quite simple, and we do need to introduce some financial terminology for it, but it is just a very natural description of what happens in a network. We have some banks, or nodes, and each bank has a certain amount of available money or funds in its possession uh, that we show in these little rectangles beside the node. And these banks are connected by debt contracts, which say that, for example, bank U has to pay one unit of money to bank V. And this naturally describes a specific amount of assets and liabilities for each bank. For example, U receives one unit of payment on its incoming debt contract and has funds of three on its own, so altogether it has assets of four. On the other hand, it has a liability of one towards bank V, so since it has more than enough assets to fulfill these obligations, it will make a payment of one on this debt contract and keep the remaining three units of money to itself. However, bank V has one unit of money itself and receives a payment of one from U, so it has assets of two. But on the other hand, it has total liabilities of four towards these two sync nodes. So this is an example of the case when V is unable to fulfill its obligations. In this case, we say that bank V is bankrupt, or in financial terms, V is in default. In this case, the model assumes that V must use all of its assets to make as much payments on these outgoing debts as possible, and it makes these payments proportionally to the payment obligations. So in this case, it will transfer one unit of money to both of the sync nodes. Furthermore, we not only care if V is in default or not, but we are also interested in the so-called recovery rate of V. That is, the proportion of payment obligations that V is able to fulfill, uh, denoted by RV. In this case, this is 2 over 4 or 1 half, and in general, if V is not in default, then its recovery rate is 1, it can fulfill all its obligations, and if V is in default, then its recovery rate is strictly less than 1. And since the payments on each edge uh, are proportional to the liabilities, this also means that we will always pay an RV portion of the payment obligations on each outgoing debt. So the simple model has already been studied in various works because it already allows us to see how a single default can cause a ripple effect throughout the network. Also, the model is rather simple and nice from a computational point of view in the sense that, apart from some degenerate cases, it only has one solution, that is, one configuration of payments that satisfies these rules, and this solution can be computed in polynomial time. However, the model is also quite limited in the sense that it cannot model various other aspects of real-world systems. For example, in practice, banks often have other types of financial derivatives on each other that create very different kind of connections in the sense that a worse situation for one bank creates a more favorable outcome for another bank. So, to also model these kinds of scenarios, the recent work of Schulden, Zucker, Soiken, and Battiston has introduced a more sophisticated financial network model that also allows conditional debt contracts, where the payment obligation depends on some specific event in the system. And in particular, they have extended the model by allowing so-called CDSs, or credit default swaps, where this event is a default. And indeed, in practice, these CDSs are a very popular kind of financial derivative, which have also played a dominant role in the financial crisis of 2008. So the main idea of a CDS is that banks U and V make a contract that if a specific third bank goes into default, then, and only then, U has to pay two units of money to V. Uh, 
And what makes this more interesting from our perspective is that this third bank might just be another bank of our financial network. So in general, there are various possible reasons why V would enter into such a CDS contract. Uh, maybe it's just a speculative bet uh, for V who has heard that rumor that W is going to go into default. Uh, but in many cases, a CDS is used as a kind of insurance policy. Imagine that W has a payment obligation towards V and for some reason, V suspects that W will not be able to fulfill this obligation. Then V might decide to enter into a CDS in reference to W. Then if W really goes def into default, then at least V receives some payment from the CDS instead. On the other hand, if W can fulfill its obligations, then V does not get any money on the CTS, but at least it receives its payment from W. And while this already describes the general idea, CDSs are in fact a bit more sophisticated in the sense that the payment obligation is actually proportional to 1 minus the recovery rate of W. Uh, we have already seen two extremes of this, when W is not in default, then there is no payment obligation on the CDS at all. And when W cannot pay at all, then the payment obligation is the entire weight of the CDS. But we can also be in between where, for example, RW is one half, and then the obligation on the CDS scales linearly between these two extremes. So let us see a simple example for such a financial system with both DAPs and CDSs. In this system, we have a bank U and a bank V that both have an outgoing debt of one and an incoming CDS in reference to each other, where if you recall, these CDSs imply a payment obligation of this amount. So here we can first of all note that the source node has enough funds to pay for its liabilities in any case. So we can just pretend for simplicity that it has inf infinitely many funds. Also, the sync node does not have any liabilities, so it cannot go into default either. So the interesting part of this system is the recovery rates of U and V. So assume first that U is in default and cannot pay any of its liabilities. This means that on the lower CDS, we have a payment obligation of two. So V receives two units of money, which means that it can make a payment of one. So it has a recovery rate of one since it pays all of its liabilities. In this case, on the upper CDS, U receives no payment at all. So it cannot make any payments, which is indeed consistent with the fact that RU is zero. On the other hand, we get a symmetric situation if we assume that V is in default with RV equals zero. Then on the upper CDS, there is a payment obligation of two. And with these two units of money, you can pay its liabilities, which means that it has a recovery rate of one. In this case, the lower CDS has a payment obligation of zero. Uh, so V has no assets, which is indeed consistent with the fact that RV is zero. So these are both solutions, equilibrium points of this system. And in fact, a deeper analysis shows that there is also a third solution where both U and V are in default with a recovery rates of two thirds. In this case, on both of the CDSs, we will have a payment obligation of two thirds. So both U and V can pay two thirds uh, to the sync node, which is consistent with the recovery rates. This means that the system has three very different equilibria. And this also poses a conflict of interest between the different nodes, since V would clearly prefer the first equilibrium where V is not in default, while U would prefer the second equilibrium where U is not in default, which raises a lot of curious questions. And indeed, there have been multiple previous works that studied this financial network model, but interestingly, they have only studied the model in terms of these equilibria that we see here, analyzing whether they exist, whether they are hard to find, how to modify them. And this is indeed a valid approach when, for example, we have a large financial crisis and the authorities have to look at the entire system in a centralized manner and decide who is in default and who is not. However, apart from these rare occasions, the system usually develops in a sequential manner in practice. One bank announces a default, then another one announces a default sometime later, and so on in such a step-by-step -step fashion. And there are many natural questions that only arise if we study this evolution of the system. So our main goal in this talk is to study such a sequential model of financial systems where the process consists of 
discrete time steps that we call updates. Essentially, we assume that banks always have an official announced recovery rate, which might not equal their current balance. And every step of the process consists of a specific bank adjusting its official recovery rate to the one that would follow from the current state of the system. For example, each node begins with an official recovery rate of 1, which means that initially there is no liability on the CDS. However, if it becomes clear that W only receives a payment of 2 on its incoming debt, then it can, and eventually has to, make an update and set its official recovery rate to one half to notify the other nodes that it can only make one half of its payments. And it is only at this point that the liability on the corresponding CDS is modified to one. Then if later an update ensures that W gets three units of payments, then W can again make an update to a new recovery rate of three quarters, which changes the liability on the CDS to one half. So looking at our previous example from this sequential perspective, initially both U and V have an official recovery rate of 1, so there is no liability on their incoming contracts. This means that both of them have zero assets and one liability, so both of them can make an update at this initial state. Let's assume that U is the first to make an update, announcing a new recovery rate of 0. This will mean that the source node now has a payment obligation of 2 towards V, so V now avoids a default and does not have to make an update anymore, and the sequential process just stops at this point. On the other hand, if the process begins by V announcing a default, then U gets a payment of 2 from the source node and it does not have to update anymore. So altogether, the final outcome of the process depends on whether U or V is the first node to make an update, also, these are the only two possible ways that the sequential process can go, so this third equilibrium we have seen is not reachable at all in the sequential model. We can never end up in this as a final state. To see some other interesting properties of this sequential approach, here's another example. In this network, the official recovery rate of V is initially 1, so there is no payment obligation on the CDS. This means that U receives no payment, so it has to announce the default, and then V realizes that it also receives no payment, so it also has to announce the default. But then this now creates a liability of 1 on the CDS, so this gives a new payment of 1 to U, which means that U comes back from the default and it can make a new update, setting its recovery rate back to 1. And then similarly, V also updates to 1. However, this leads us back to the initial state of the system where there is no payment on the CDS. So the bank's going to default again, and we keep periodically repeating the same steps. Note that the system does have an equilibrium where the recovery rates are both one half, but we never reach this equilibrium. Instead, we keep repeating the same few steps infinitely, and the process never terminates. So these two examples already show some of the most important properties of this sequential model. We've seen that nodes can occasionally come back from a default if they acquire new assets later in the network. We've also seen that not every equilibrium of the network can be reached as a final outcome. We've seen that the sequential process might keep on going indefinitely and not stabilize after any number of updates. And finally, we've seen that the outcome of the process is heavily dependent on the order in which we execute the updates of specific nodes. And we are going to look into these last two questions in a bit more detail to see if we can make more observations on the stabilization time of these networks and also whether there is a best ordering in some sense for these updates and whether we can find this. And in particular, the two questions are also connected because stabilization time is also something that depends on the order of updates. If you look at this example system, which is essentially a combination of our previous two examples, then initially each node has an announced recovery rate of 1, and if U is the first node to report the default, because it has no assets, then this already gives a valid payment configuration, and so the system already stabilizes after this first step. On the other hand, if V is the first node to report the default, then there will be no payment going to this upper part of the system, and one can observe that in this case, this upper part is equivalent to our previous example system that never stabilizes. So 
Based on our choice of the first node to make an update, the system can either stabilize after one step or not stabilize at all. So given that even a small part of the system can produce such an infinite behavior, it's hard to say many meaningful things about stabilization time in general. However, we make one more observation, namely that the process can also last very long when we do have stabilization. More specifically, we can develop a construction where the process takes an exponential number of steps, but after this, it does stabilize eventually. And moreover, this holds for any possible ordering in the system. This construction is much more involved than the previous examples, but the main idea behind it is that we can come up with a gadget that represents a mutable binary variable, and also gadgets that can capture states and transitions between these states, allowing us to simulate a state machine or a finite automaton. And then using these tools, we can build a binary counter on theta n bits, which counts from zero to the maximum value on these bits. And after this counting has stopped, the network stabilizes. Furthermore, note that besides providing an example for a long but finite stabilization time, this network is also interesting because it also suggests that these financial networks could be essentially used as a model of computation and studied from this more theoretical perspective. In terms of comparing different orderings, it's also a natural question to ask if we can find the best ordering that produces the most favorable outcome in some sense. From a financial authority's perspective, one natural goal would be to find the ordering that produces the smallest number of defaulting banks in the final outcome. Of course, one can again create an example showing that this is highly dependent on the ordering. In this system, if V is the first to announce the default, then the process terminates with a single default, while if U is the first to announce the default, then all these nodes in the lower chain will eventually end up in a default. And one can also show that in general, finding this best ordering is an NP-hard problem through a reduction from the maxed problem. Intuitively, we can use our first example system to represent a binary variable, which evaluates the true or false depending on whether the upper or lower node reports a default first. And then we can also easily devise a closed gadget where a bank avoids a default exactly if one of the literals in the corresponding clause is set to true. So the whole reduction idea here is rather straightforward. Another possible approach is to look at it from the perspective of a single bank and to see if this bank can achieve a better outcome for itself by making an update at a specific time. In our first example, we have already seen that this can indeed be the case with late defaulting. In this system, U and V were both motivated to delay their default announcement for as long as possible, because if the other node reports a default earlier, then this means that they can avoid the default entirely. So as you might expect, delaying your default announcement can be a good strategy in some cases. What's much more surprising is that it turns out that early defaulting can also be a good idea in some cases. One can construct a system where the only way that a node can avoid the default in the final state of the system is that if this node is the first one to announce a default. And just to sketch the main idea here, you can have a system where nodes v1 and v2 can report the default initially, and if v1 is the first to do so, then this ensures that the defaults in another part of the system happen in a specific way, and these defaults then provide new assets and liabilities to the first part of the system that bring v1 back from the default and push v2 into default instead. And since the system is symmetrical, if v2 were the first to report the default, then this would lead to the opposite outcome where v2 survives and v1 is in default. So as surprising as it sounds, in some cases, early defaulting is the only strategy that allows a node to survive in the end of the sequential process. And in general, we can also show that finding the best time to report a default is an NP-hard problem, even if the rest of the system is completely predictable. To prove this, we can essentially combine the binary counter construction with the max out reduction idea. On a high level, the bits of the binary counter can represent the values of the different variables, so the counting process essentially enumerates all different variable assignments. And then we also have a special node V, which can report the default anytime, which immediately terminates the counting process. And then the system provides new assets back to V based on the number of satisfied closes in the formula 
So essentially stopping the counter at the right time corresponds to selecting the best variable assignment for the formula. So besides studying all these properties of the model, it's also worth asking whether this sequential model is realistic. And if you look at the basic properties, most of these do not sound that bad for practice. It's only this infinite running time that seems very unreasonable. So it is natural to wonder if we can come up with a different sequential model variant that does not have this property. And actually the answer is yes, we can. By changing a couple of our assumptions, we can obtain another sequential model without this property, but I'm only going to sketch the base idea of this now. One ingredient to this different sequential model is so-called smart updates. On a very high level, we can sort the steps of our sequential process into two categories. There are steps that change the liabilities in the network through a CDS. And there are other steps where a bank simply adjusts its recovery rate to the given situation, but this does not change the network of obligations. And while the second kind of step seems harmless, it can actually also last for infinitely long. Uh, it can happen that even though the liabilities never change, the updates are only converging to an equilibrium slowly. So the point of smart updates is to basically remove this second step by essentially computing the equilibrium of the system after each liability change, uh, which is doable in polynomial time, since for fixed liabilities we basically have a depth on the network, and then ensure that nodes directly update to this computed recovery rate. So intuitively, this removes the part of the process that is about information spreading and this iterative solving of a fixed point problem and keeps the steps that really affect the obligations in the network. Moreover, we can also do these smart updates slightly differently in a method that we call optimistic updates, where the base idea is the same. We just do the computations a little differently. Essentially, the difference here is that while smart updates will compute the outgoing payments from any node by analyzing the network to see how many assets it has, optimistic updates will handle defaulting and non-defaulting nodes slightly differently. For defaulting nodes, we again compute the amount of outgoing payments by analyzing the network, but to the nodes that haven't reported a default yet, we give the benefit of a doubt and assume that they can fulfill all their obligations uh, even if the current network state suggests otherwise. So, of course, this description is far from formal, but we really only want to give you the general idea of what's behind these methods. And another modification to our original model is liability freezing. In our original setting, we have assumed that if V is in default, but the payment obligation on an incoming CDS increases, then this can bring V back from the default. Now, in contrast to this, liability freezing assumes that when V defaults, then the liability on its incoming and outgoing CDSs is fixed at the current level forever, uh, essentially turning it into a simple debt contract, so that even if the reference entity makes an update in the future, the liability on the edge is not changing anymore. In practice, such a model corresponds to a setting where there's a larger time difference between these updates, so by the time the next update happens, V has already gone through the first steps of the insolvency process and was expected to cash in all the incoming payments from all of its contracts. And the interesting point behind these changes is that if we combine optimistic updates with liability freezing, then we obtain a monotone sequential model where the recovery rates of every bank can only decrease with each update and hence this infinite periodic behavior can never occur. So this monotonicity means that every bank can go into default at most once during the process. And with this, one can also show that the entire process can never last for more than quadratically many steps. So stabilization is indeed guaranteed. On the other hand, the drawback of this monotonicity is that if recovery rates only decrease, then this is a sequential model where nodes can never return from the default. So we have lost another more or less realistic property from the model. So this already shows that one of the most natural open questions in this setting is whether we can come up with a sequential model that is even more realistic than these previous ones. And in particular with one that allows reversing defaults, but also guarantees stabilization at the same time. 
However, there are also other aspects of the model where we could try to get closer to practical financial systems, uh, for example, by introducing some form of concurrency or a setting with incomplete information. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions in the live session.